talking to her about, babe, I just need to go for just get a few things. It'll be in and out and it'll be no problem. And she just had a problem with going. Libby was paying attention and all of a sudden she joins the conversation and she says, mama, you get what you get, but you don't throw a fit. (laughs) I mean, I loved it. She was honest. Aaron was throwing a fit because we were going to belt. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She was not throwing a fit, but she did say that. But think about this. Tommy's note to his teacher. Dear Miss McMahon, you're a good teacher, but you're not my favorite. Or Susan's letter to her mom. Mommy, I love you sometimes. Or Joyce, she wrote this letter to God and uh, it said, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. (laughs) Or Norma, she also wrote to God and I really like this one. It says, Dear God, did you mean for a giraffe to look like that or was that an accident? Honest, right? Is that animal really supposed to look like that? Or was that just an accident? Or here's my favorite one, little Billy. He was filling out his homework assignment. And the question was, positive ways your family handles stress. And then his answer was, my daddy says, suck it up. (laughs) Honesty. And I guess, do I need to try this? Okay, I may have to go down there. I got, let me just come down here. I'm moving down. Can I move down, brethren? Is that scriptural? For a moment. Think about that. Think about what that says. How important is honesty in a Christian's life? Why would we need to spend any time talking about honesty? Isn't it just a simple little truth? Honesty. I looked it up on my phone. You know, the phone knows everything, but look at what it says. It's a facet of moral character that shows positive attributes as integrity, truthfulness, straightforwardness, absence of lying, cheating, and being a thief. It also involves being trustworthy, loyal, fair, and sincere. That's a lot of stuff. As a child of God and someone who follows Christ... We can all say without a shadow of a doubt that a Christian living in the world today should without a doubt have honesty as a character they possess. Amen. So when it comes to the mind of Christ, what were his thoughts on honesty? Let me compile some thoughts for us. What did Jesus say about honesty? Well, If you think about Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes, Jesus says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why do I bring that up? A pure heart is a unstained with guilt heart. See, in order for me to be able to be honest, I've got to get rid of some guilt, don't I? What if I have guilt in my heart? Do I act honest? If I have guilt in my heart, how do I act? It's a skewed view, isn't it? Because in my mind, if I have guilt, I'm going to do everything I can to keep that guilt from consuming me. 
And therefore, I can't be as honest as I need to be. Jesus, in establishing, just talking about the Christian way, he says, blessed are the pure in heart because when they are pure in heart, they can see God because they see the truth that he presents for all of us to see. Now watch this. In Luke chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus talking about the the different types of soils. You remember that story, don't you? You know, the first soil that fell on the wayside that, that that the birds picked up really quick. And then it talked about this seed that was thrown into this soil that got just a little bit. It rejoiced really good, but it never got really good root. And then when the sun came out, it dried it up. And then th- this third type of soil, it, it had these thorns and these red, it just wasn't where it needed to be at. Now it grew up, but what happened was those thorns grew up with it and choked that seed out. And then it talked about Jesus. He, he says in Luke 18, 8, 15, that there was this soil that this seed fell on, which was considered good ground. And those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart, kept it and bear fruit with patience. The Greek word for noble right there means a honest heart. A beautifully magnificent heart. Brethren, when we think about our lives and we think about our heart and we think about what it looks like, where do we measure up with that? Is it beautiful to look at? Is it beautiful to consider the things that are in it? that go through our mind, that go through our actions, the way our motives are moved? Is our heart something that's beautiful to look at? See, what does Jesus talk about honesty? When he talks about honesty, what what is he trying to get us to see? See, if I'm going to have a pure heart, a heart that is not filled with Guilt, a heart that's not filled with all of these evil things, but a heart that is pure and clean. If I have a heart that is beautiful to look at, now all of a sudden that changes the way that I live. See, you remember Jesus saying this in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. And brethren, Jesus is saying this to us today too, right? As his children. Jesus is saying, if you abide in my word, if you listen to what I say, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth is going to do what, brethren? The truth is going to set you free. Don't you like to be free? Or do you like to be held captive? You want to know what holds you captive? A heart that ain't right. You want to know what holds you captive? A heart that's not pure. You want to know what holds you captive? Sin. Jesus says, I want you to remove this sin from within you and I want you to abide. I want you to stay connected to my word. And what's going to happen? You're going to know what I say and that truth is going to do something amazing. Can I preach to y'all this morning from down here real close to you? You want to know what the truth is going to do? The truth is going to set you free. What am I talking about? Matthew chapter 5 verse 37. Here it is. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is what? It's evil. Hey man, you think you can help me do this? Yes. If I say yes, then what do I need to do? Do it, right? Anything more than that is not right, is it? What is Jesus trying to tell us to do? How is our heart? Where is our mind at? What are we thinking about? See, Christians are different What is Jesus saying about honesty? He's saying, let your word be your bond, right? If you say you're going to do problems come up, absolutely. Things happen. Yes, I get it. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is saying something and not having any intentions on doing it. Being a liar. 
You remember what happens to liars, right? What did Jesus say about honesty? Point blank. Jesus said his words. He says, let your word be your bond. If you say you're going to do it, then do it. And don't add anything else to it. What an example. Amen. Now, think about this. What are the benefits of doing that? Why, why is that beneficial for our lives? What are the benefits of being honest? Well, Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Walk with me on this real quick. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And yeah, we use this verse in a lot of ways. But think about this. If I have a pure heart, if my heart is something beautiful to look at, if I have this magnificent heart because I put God's word in it and I apply it to my life, then I can be content, can I? Whatever I got, I'm okay with. Now, wait a minute, Matt. What you're saying is just eliminate hopes and dreams, right? Eliminate hopes and dreams. Don't think about anything in the future. Just think about what you got and that's it. No, that's not what I'm saying. What we have to realize is what we're at right now is where we're at. Now, do I set goals up? Do I talk to Aaron about things we want to do, the money we want to save, the places we want to go? Absolutely. I want to do all of those things. But until it happens, I'm going to be content. Amen? See, look at what happens. He says, don't let your conduct be with covetousness. Don't covet things to the point where it consumes you. Hey, you know what? I don't have that yet. I want this new car and I really am striving to do it. And I'm saving up my money to get it because this is the one I want, right? I remember that first time that I paid for a car that I bought. I owned that Explorer out there. I paid for that thing. You know what? I'm proud of that. Should I be? I paid for it. You want to know, I walked in there that day, me and Aaron, and I sat down <laughs> Me and Aaron walk in five, six years ago. I, I can't remember. I had just gotten off work. We sat down. We get ready to do the finances. And the guy comes up. And guess who he turns to to ask who's going to do the financing? Ma'am, are you going to do the financing yourself? You want to know what happened in that moment? <laughs> no, she ain't doing it. I'm doing it. Put it in my name. Right? So the guy goes off. He comes back immediately, y'all. And you know what he said to me? I'm sorry, man. I just judged you wrong. We'll have your stuff right out. Your credit is incredible. When we think about coveting things, when it becomes something that consumes us, we can't be content, right? I'm proud of, yeah, that story is a side story and another time and I'm just going to leave it there. But it hurt that day. But you know what? I was proud I didn't act a fool, right? I'm proud that I held my ground the right way. I'm proud of that. And I'm proud to say that I own that vehicle because I paid for it by myself. Didn't nobody help me. <laughs> I did it. Because I had a dream that I wanted to own that car. Now, there's nothing wrong with having those dreams. But when it becomes something that consumes you and you can't get to it yet, it's a problem. In Christianity, if I'm honest with myself, what I understand is I can't walk this walk by myself. I need the Lord. And if I need the Lord, then this becomes my comment. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Nothing. See, I'm content. But what else? Look at what else uh, we can consider this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. 
What are the benefits of honesty? We can be content in our life. We can also have a quiet and peaceable life. Amen? Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Why do you bring this up, Matt? If I'm honest with myself, I can make a vote. I can say who I want to be in office, but at the end of the day, when the picks come out and the choice is uh, chosen, what do I have to realize? That's who it is, all right? That's who it is. So here, Paul, and think about who he's talking about now. He's talking about kings who want to persecute Christians. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. I can't change what's happening, but I can pray for it. I can ask God to help me for it. And in that, in my honesty and my understanding, I can have a quiet and peaceable life. What happens when we let these things consume us? What happens, brethren? Don't we see it all over Facebook? Makes me sad. Think about brethren fighting, fussing over mess. If we can be honest with ourselves, the only one that can change anything in this world is Jesus Christ. That's who I'm going to. That's who I'm picking every time, amen? Because he can do amazing things through me, but only him, only him. See, when I'm honest with myself, when I really break it down, see, I can be content and I can have this quiet and peaceable life. I'm not letting things consume me, but what else? I can have a good conscience. Think about this. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorable. See, if I'm honest with myself, then I understand that God is in control. If I understand that he's the one that's guiding my life, now all of a sudden my motives change. We talked about this in class today. See, my motives are different now. Now look at what he says. He prays for us. Uh, The the Hebrew writer says, pray for us because we're confident that we got a good conscience. How does it feel when we have a good conscience versus a guilty conscience? (laughs) Have you ever had a guilty conscience? I mean, I don't, maybe I'm the only one who's ever had a guilty, I've had a guilty conscience before. And if it's towards somebody else, if I've done something that I wasn't supposed to do, and then I see them, that guilty conscience is just almost, uh, it just, uh, right? Uh, It scratches and itches and bothers and you can't get rid of it. But what if I have a good conscience? See, if my conscience is right, If I'm honest with myself, I can't do it. But I know somebody who can. I know somebody who's done it. See, if I'm I'm, uh, honest with myself, these benefits start piling up. Contentment, peaceable and quiet life, a good example. And you know what else? I get to show people. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. There was many a times at work. Nobody was there. It was just me. I could have done it the wrong way. I could have been dishonest and nobody would have probably known. Because you know what? That dishonest way was a whole lot quicker than the honest way. The boss told me to do it like this, but you know what? I'm not doing it like that because I know that he's trying to look out for our safety, but we got to hurry up. I'm going to take out safety and I'm going to go ahead and hurry up and get this job done, right? But see, honesty, even in the grand scheme of it, why did it take you so long? Because we did what you told us to do, right? 
you told me to do that, and, and that's what I did. And yeah, it took a little bit longer, and I'm sorry. We'll try harder next time. But I'm honest, and I have a good conscience, and it doesn't bother me to tell him that. What are the benefits of honesty that we get to be an example? And here's the big one, and I want to bring us back to this. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who have this good heart and this honest heart. Look at what happens. They bear fruit. Don't you want to bear fruit, brethren? I mean, I want to bear fruit, man. I want to bear fruit. How about you? What are the benefits of honesty? You get to bear fruit. Now, real quickly, what are the benefits of being dishonest? Here it is. <laughs> these are some incredible ones. You may want to jump on these. The first one is you get to be a liar. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Here's what Paul said about liars. Don't lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. If I'm dishonest, what I become is a liar. The quality that you can have as a dishonest person and the name that you can be called and be proud of maybe is a liar. Well, what about this one? Maybe, maybe you don't want to be involved in a liar, but maybe you want to be a slanderer. Proverbs 6, 19. And in Proverbs, chapter, Proverbs 6, verse 16, it talks about the six things the, Lord's hate, the Lord hates and seven is an abomination. And then he goes to verse 19, and this is one of the things that he hates that's an abomination, a false witness. Somebody who just talks about somebody falsely and sows discord among the brethren. See, the benefits of being dishonest is you get to be a liar and you get to be a slanderer. And you know what else you can be? You can be a false teacher. How important is honesty, brethren? Look at what Paul said. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech they deceive hearts of the simple. A liar, a slanderer, a false teacher... And one of my favorite Proverbs ever is Proverbs 22, 13. The lazy man says, there's a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. I can't go to work today. I might die. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And anything more than that is evil. See, the benefits of being dishonest is you become a slacker. Honesty is something that has to be a part of the Christian's life. Amen? So how do we maintain honesty in our lives? Timothy just read it, and I really want you to consider this. And Paul obviously thought it was very important as we close up because he says, I beg you. Why in the world would Paul say, I beg you? What happens when you beg somebody? I'm begging you, man, don't kick me out. I'm begging you, man, don't do that to me. I'm begging you. If somebody's begging, what are they doing? They're pleading with you to, to do something, right? Paul says, I'm begging you, brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Are you honest? Are you uh, being conformed to the world and saying, you know what, I'm honest, man. I ain't trying to hear that mess, Matt. I know that guy. I know that. You want to know what I, I'd like for you to do today? I'd like for you to be honest with yourself. I'd like for you to be honest with yourself. I want you to hear this real quick. There was a poll that was done, and it's been done a while ago, and it's probably even worse now. It showed that 56% of Americans taught their children the concept of honesty. Half. 
And then another poll said that 65% of high school students would cheat on an important exam. 65. Would you cheat on an exam, y'all? I raised my hand. I've done it before. And you know what? I thought it was cool at the time. 65% of high school students said that they were okay with cheating. A little white cheat, right? Recently, this physician, he appeared on a network talk show, and, and this is what he said. Lying is an important part of social life. This is a physician now, somebody who knows something in the world, y'all. Lying is an important part of social life. And children who are unable to do it are children who may have developmental problems. You want to know how real honesty is? Your kids are getting taught. You you don't need it. It's actually a problem. It's actually something that you don't need to teach your kids. Brethren, how are you acting? How are you talking? How are you doing things around these children? What kind of example are you being? Here's what this physician says, that if you ain't teaching them to lie, then you're teaching your kid how to have a developmental problem. Wow. The world is going to continue to portray the ways of the Lord as silly and foolish and ridiculous. Are we going to jump on that bandwagon? Or are we going to be children of God who know better? You want to know what Romans chapter 20, I mean, Revelation chapter 22 says? Maybe. (laughs) Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Do you believe that that's a real place? Do we believe that that's where we're about to go? Because look at what it says. But on the outside of that city, outside of that gate, are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murders and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Having honesty be a part of our lives is a huge benefit for our families, for our employers, for our employees, for our community, for the world, and for the body of Christ. We need it. If we had to be honest with ourselves today, is it time to fix some things that are wrong in our lives? If we had to be honest, is it time to repent? Is it time to ask for forgiveness? Is it time to make something wrong right and become that good soil, that good ground that has that honest, that noble and good heart? Maybe you're here today and you're struggling. Maybe you're here today and you haven't been honest like you should. Make it right today. Maybe you're here today, though, and you're, if you had to be honest, you come to this conclusion that you're not a child of God. Oh, friend, don't miss the opportunity to be added to the greatest family ever where you get to go be a part of the tree of life. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter on the day of Pentecost says, because you believe and you know that you killed this Christ because you're asking me, what do we need to do? How do we fix this wrong? Peter told them to repent, to turn from their sin and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Go into the water, old man, and come out brand new. (laughs) That's such an awesome thing I get to talk about all the time. Becoming brand new and added to the family of God. If you need to obey the gospel, please, why don't you come right now? Together we stand and sing.